Hello and welcome to episode 3 of the Peter Greenwood Show at the Edinburgh Fringe. If you missed the first two episodes, you know, just take a look down there, right there. My name is Peter Greenwood and I am interviewing some of the best guests from the Edinburgh Fringe this year. And on today's show, I've got Harry and Chris coming up, I've got Susan Riddle, but we are starting with Jade Adams. And as you can see, it all went very wrong very quickly. Take a listen. I'm here at the Edinburgh Fringe. My name is Peter Greenwood, and can I ask your name and what you do, please? I'm Jade Adams, and I'm a comedian. How are you, Jane? Are you well? Jade. Jade. Start started off well. Yep. Keep this in, though. Oh, you can't absolutely. get rid of that. It's funny. I don't cut anything. Don't cut anything. You must keep in that you got my name wrong at the start of the interview. It happens around here a lot, because, excuse me, I'm meeting a croissant. Not oh. at all. Right there, sir. Let's go in. Basically... When you're in Edinburgh, you meet so many people. I've been coming up here for about nine years. You meet so many people in this industry, and unless someone makes a real impression on you or some sort of memorable situation happens, you ain't going to remember their name specifically. And people get very, very upset about that. Have I, I upset ha- you? No, not so. I don't care. I'm on stage amplified every night. I think my ego's in check. But there's some people that are, really need you to remember their name. And I had a person last year, like came up to me and sort of set me up that I, I knew I wouldn't know her. I sort of set it up before I got there. <laughs> and I said to her, oh, you need to be a bit more memorable, babe. I definitely will remember you now. But it's hard to remember uh, names or say them right and stuff. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Especially as you said it like five seconds. But you, just you said before. Your name I mean, just that before. is slightly different to my story. Whereas I had like an entire year before seeing her and then... You had seconds yeah. to remember it, but it's all right. We've got over it. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're very kind. It's all right. So tell me about your show. What's it like? Uh, my show is a, 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 a working class woman's take on fourth wave feminism. Right. I find that there are a lot of uh, inconsistencies in fourth wave feminism because it's wrapped up in the internet and capitalism. Um, and I sometimes think that the most vulnerable members of the uh, of the UK, who I'm specifically talking about in this, which are working class teenage girls, often are left with role models that have had a lot of surgery and facial stuff done, which isn't an issue. But I feel like if we're going to try and encourage women to be confident and positive, you need to give role models that aren't literally the uh, the face of insecurities. <laughs> um, and it's also me taking myself seriously. The last four years of doing shows uh, well three years of doing shows I've come up here and brought a lot of sequins and big hair and tales of drag queens and stand up and songs and all sorts of lovely stuff but I was told by someone this year that I didn't take myself seriously enough to be considered a stand-up comedian so I've taken that and I've essentially ran with with that theme and I'm doing the whole thing in a black turtleneck because there's nothing that screams take me seriously in 2019 and that's a woman sat talking about issues in a black turtleneck. And maybe a beret as well. Uh, do you know what? I tried. It's too much. Is it? Yeah, it goes straight back to the exactly what I was trying to get away with. Isn't that funny? It is. A beret. You'd not think that, would you? Yeah. You'd think it'd accent your point, like only serious people wear berets. Only French people. They don't even wear them, to be honest with you. I went to France and no one was wearing a beret. Is that true? I was really disappointed about that. I went to Paris, um, which actually is a story that features at the end of my show. Um, but I, this isn't the story that features at the end of my show. But one of the things we did was go, and go around try and find French cliches. There are none. They really don't like those. What do they do if if you ask them about French cliches? I didn't ask them. We were just looking for them. We were almost playing like Paris Bingo. So there were like stripy <laughs> t-shirt. We were like looking for a man with garlic around his neck. That, that that was like a lot of points. That was like 30 points. Beret was like 10 points. We thought we'd see it actually. Man holding baguette or woman holding baguette. baguette. That was in there. That was like five points because that would be quite easy to see. You just got to hang out by a bakery. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Some people might call this racist. I don't know. I don't know. If stereotyping. It's stereotyping. But I'm Bristolian, and I get stereotyped all the time. Oh, what is that? There's a flying thing here. I don't like it. Get away. I get stereotyped all the time, and that's part of the reason why I'm putting the black jumper on. Oh, look, my beloved and Elliot Steele have arrived. Oh. Hi, guys. I'm in the middle of my own interview. Yeah, we're really going to smash it up the all right. This is my boyfriend. Right. 
Uh, he features at the end of my show, actually. So it's sort of apt that he's oh. here. Um, you so almost couldn't a, have written that any better, could you? I know, just walked in. As a we're, as a Bristolian, I'm not often taken seriously with this accent, and um, because it's uh, it's fu- it's one of the. Where are you from? What's your accent? Ah, well, therein lies the question. Campbelltown, which is on the west coast of Scotland, but I've lived in Greenock. For oh, you've got a very soft. I can hear it now. You've got a very soft Scottish accent. Scottish accent, haven't you? So much. It's soft though. That's yeah. why you don't immediately hear it. Yeah. And I thought he might be Swedish when I first met you. I could, I could do with being Swedish. But now I can hear that you're Scottish. Thank you so much. No, normally, when people meet me, they say, "What part of England are you from?" And I'm like, "From the west coast of Scotland." You can hear it when you say Scotland, Scotland. You Scotland. can say it there. Yeah. But um, with this accent, it's you know, Bristolians are sort of synonymous with like sort of farmers and yokels and. Mm-hmm. All that sort of stuff, and you know, there's some offensive uh, stereotypes I say about myself about uh, incest. Um, but actually, Bristolian people, and one of the reasons everyone loves living there is they're super, super emotionally intelligent. And I suppose that's what my show's calling for is a bit of sort of emotional intelligence from people because feminism so often in a middle class conversation is always sort of um, overwritten and over explained when it needs to be very simple. Because when you make something simple, it makes more people understand it. But a lot of a lot of the time, people don't care about that. They just want to seem intellectual and and that's it. But that's for me, that's not what equality is about. And so I'm. I'm in my own way simplifying a very complicated conversation for an audience of people, which is essentially this way of trying to find your confidence is totally rubbish. But if you just be yourself, it's a really simple message that I'm sure other people have said, but I I think I'm... Because I used to be one of the only girls that came up to Edinburgh wearing sequins and cat suits and big hair, but that's uh, I've changed the face of comedy, mate. And now I'm not the only one. And so I thought, you know what there isn't up there is a working class girl sat down on a stool talking about issues in a black turtleneck. Um, and uh, I, I, I could talk about these subjects for ages, so you must jump in and stop me. Not at all. You, you carry on. I would like to know, do you... This is probably going to sound a very silly question, but do you miss the old shows compared to this new one? What's How does the new one change? I'm still, I'm still doing it. Okay. It's just a new show. There's a new... I always do a new theme and I have a new haircut. And I always do something new with the show. And and this is just a show that's like this. But I, I wrote a format show last year called The Divine Miss Jade. And um, I'll do that again. But that show's too big for me at the moment. I'm not famous enough to... Um, to actually be able to afford to do the Divine Miss Jade, but yeah. one day. Someday. Mm. <laughs> Where can people find out more about you online and find out more about the show? Uh, come to my social media, Instagram, it's Ms. Jade Adams. Not Miss, Ms. M-S, Ms. Jade Adams, and that's spelled J-A-Y-D-E Adams. Ms. is because <clears throat> when I was younger, I said to mum, what's the difference between Ms. and Miss? And she said, Miss is someone waiting to get married. And I went, well, I'll never be waiting to get married. So I changed it to Ms. at the age of eight. Um, at Jade Adams on Twitter and F- Jade Adams Comedy on Facebook, my Facebook page. And where can people find tickets for the show? Pleasants to In the Courtyard at 9.30pm until 10.30. Not a single day off because I'm working class and I want to earn the money. Yeah, you've got to get in there and grind. Yeah. <laughs> Jade, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thanks for coming. Not my finest moment as a broadcaster, I think you will all agree, but Jade Adams is doing a show. It is called The Ballad of Kylie Jenner's Old Face. The show is on at Pleasance 2 up at the Pleasance Courtyard and is running from the 8th until the 25th of August. Next up is Lucy Jane Atkinson. She is a director. Her show is called Anguis, and she joined me a week or so via the medium of telephone before the fringe so she could discuss how the show came together. Let's talk a little bit about the show because, as you can, as we can hear, there's a little bit of, of chatting away behind you. What's going on back there? What's happened today? Uh, so we just had our very first preview uh, at Edinburgh Fringe, um, and it it went really well, which is good. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's um, it's been an intense day, but we got through it, and it's the audience seems to really like it. So I'm in a good mood. That's, good. that's excellent. <laughs> While you're in, while you're in pre, what's the difference between the preview and the actual performance? As somebody who's not really ah. in theatre, <laughs> um, so the previews um, are basically the 
the play is still sort of subject to change. Okay. Um, so we we don't have any press in for the first two performances so that the actors have a chance to kind of get used to the play in the space with an audience, but without the kind of pressure of being reviewed. Um, uh, and the creative team get to go like, oh, that line's not working. We should maybe cut that or let's move this moment to over here. Or, you know, the, the play is still a little bit in flux. And then our press night is going to be, or press afternoon is on Tuesday. And that's when the show will be, will be locked. And then for the rest of the month, it will stay the same and we'll stop tinkering with it. That must be really nerve wracking though. Like the previews must feel like, I don't want to say it's last in, chance. It's intense. But... <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty intense. It's, you just have to have like all of your senses really, really tuned in. Um, yeah. You need to know where, what's happening. You need to know it's going down. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so let me ask you about a little bit about the play. It's called Anguish, and it is yes, running it is. from the uh, 30th of uh, yes, July. Yes, so from, from today, um, into, which is the 31st, I think. 31st, um, of course it is. Yes, so it opened uh, today at 3 o'clock on the 31st, and it's running until the 26th of August, which is the last day of the festival. And it is playing at the Gilded Balloon as well, just so people just so it people know. It is Gilded Balloon Teviot Dining Room. Yes. Wow, that's a very fancy sounding sounding place. <laughs> it is. It's a very fancy looking room. I can't it's wait to see it. It's very comfy. I like it. <laughs> what is Anguish? Tell us a little bit about the play and how you got involved in it. Ah, so Anguish uh, is the first play written by Sheila Atim. Uh, so she is an Olivier Award winning actress. She's also an MBE. Um, and she was commissioned back in February by Avalon and the BBC uh, to write a play, which she has never done before. Um, and she was inspired by discovering that no one knows how Cleopatra actually died. Um, everyone thinks they do because of William Shakespeare, um, but they they have never found her remains. They've never found a burial site for her, anything like that. Um, so Sheila kind of took this as an idea um, and has the play is an imagined conversation, a podcast recording between a contemporary uh, black female virologist, virologist um, and Queen Cleopatra uh, talking about uh the nature of kind of truth and the extent to which you can hold on to your story once it's out in the world. That's an interesting concept, especially the bit about how you have to hold on to your truth, because there's a saying with, oh, how does it go? There's three versions of the truth, your truth, my truth, and the truth. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I've got you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think also that, that idea that, you know, once, once something is out in the world, how much control do you have about how it's how it's read, how it's perceived, how people see you through that narrative? You know, so people think of Cleopatra as this ruthless seductress who managed to like seduce these two powerful Roman leaders and then who like very nobly and defiantly killed herself so as to not be a slave. And, you know, some of that is probably true, but she was also uh, you know, a wife and a mother and a scientist and a stateswoman and all of these other things. And the image that we have of her is relatively one dimensional, um, yeah. but it's very popular. So, yeah. So how did you get involved in the play? Uh, so I, uh, I'm a new writing director uh, and I primarily work on um, quite early career emerging writers um, and I kind of help bring new plays by new writers to life. Um, and so Avalon got in touch with me because they were looking for someone who would be a kind of safe and supportive pair of hands uh, for this new play by this new writer um, in order to kind of help midwife it into the world in a, in the most supportive and, and uh, artistic way possible. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been on it. I was hired back in May um, and then we cast it in June and then we've been rehearsing for the whole of July and it's running for all of August. So it's a relatively fast turnaround for me for a show, um, but it's it's been an absolute joy and Sheila is kind of terrifyingly talented so it's been it's been good 
<laughs> That's something I was going to ask. What's it like getting a show together? Because as you said, you were cast in May. Uh, casting happened in... No, you weren't cast in May. You were hired in May. I was hired in May. Casting yeah. happened in June. And yes. you were rehearsing all through July. That's a remarkably quick process. Doesn't that ever terrify you? Oh, yeah. Well, every day. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's exciting. It's scary and it's exciting. I think, you know, the the really lovely thing about working in theatre is that it is, it's live and it's all about people, you know, and it's about getting people that you admire and talented people and smart people together in a room and then just having as many conversations as you can possibly have, really. Um, and I, like, I read the script uh, before I was hired for the job and really liked it. And then throughout May, we did a couple of readings on sort of re redrafts of the script. Um, and then in the first two weeks of rehearsal, we went through six or seven redrafts of the script, uh, which was very intense. Uh, but that's how it always sort of works with new writing so we've really only had two weeks working on the on the draft that's up here at the festival but the two week script development that we did meant that our actors really really understand the text and understand why everything that's in there is in there because they've also had a hand in kind of shaping it into what what the audience will be seeing this month that must be absolutely terrifying <laughs> the good kind of terrifying yeah the, you, you know you feel like you're accomplishing a, something yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's sculpting something, it's building something, it's collaborate, like collaboratively building something that you all believe in and you're trying to make as beautiful and as powerful and as clear as you possibly can so that then you can have 130 people see it every day and all understand it and, uh, and connect to it in the way that, that you want them to do. It's, uh, it's a scary process, but I think it's also a very, a kind of human human process of just trying to be understood. You yeah. know, that's yeah. what theatre making is, really. <laughs> now, you mentioned working with Sheila Adam, who is an Olivier Award-winning actress and also has an MBE. How, what's, <laughs> is that not terrifying as well? What What's she like um, as a person? I mean, yes and no. Like, the good thing is she's really cool. Like, um, she's, I mean, she's insanely intelligent. Before she started acting, she uh, was training to be a doctor. Um, so she has wow. a kind of medical background as well, which plays into the show. Um, and obviously, even though this is the first play that she's written, she has acted in so many uh, plays and a lot of them have been new writing. So she has a real understanding of the structure of a new writing process. Um, which has been a real a real bonus uh, in terms of in terms of working on this show. But she's just she's very very intuitive. Uh, she's very you know she's good at listening. She's good at she's not precious about the text at all. As long as what we're working towards is is clear, um, which is really lovely because sometimes you work with with writers and they're like, no, it's my word and it's the Bible and you just need to somehow make it work. Yeah. Um, and Sheila is not like that, which is. Lovely for me. Uh, it makes my job much easier and makes the room a lot warmer as a place. <laughs> I was thinking that must be su such a weight off when you when you can work with somebody who's like, no, no, go go ahead, have fun with it, as opposed to somebody who is like, you will do it like this. Every word, every yes. full stop must be observed. <laughs> yes, indeed. It's uh, it's a real joy. It's a real pleasure. So the, the play is open. It's in previews right now. What's it like being yeah. up in Edinburgh and working in the space? How are you enjoying that? It's beautiful. It's lovely. I um I've not been up to Edinburgh for a couple of years actually. I I spent two years while I was at uni working on box office up here during the fringe. Um, really? So I've kind of yeah at the the space at Surgeons Hall. Um yeah. So I did two years of kind of being up for the whole month and working eight hour days. And I saw both years. I saw like eighty shows over the course of the fringe, which was kind of insane. Mm. Um, but when when you're twenty, that's what you do. Um, <laughs> And then I I directed a show here four or five years ago, but I haven't been up since then. So it's really lovely being back and everything feeling sort of familiar but different and coming up with two shows that I really believe in and that I can kind of put, put my heart and soul into uh, while also being in the very enviable, enviable position of not having to fly up. Um, yeah. It's yeah. really nice. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a little bit about the, about being on both, because as you said, you used to be up in the ticket office, so you've seen both sides of the fringe. What are, what are the similarities yeah. and also the differences between the two sides of, of, the, thrin, of the fringe? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I think, what are the similarities and differences? Um, I think working on box office is is amazing and i like everyone who works in theater should have well just everyone who goes to the theater should have an experience of working on a box office just so that you're polite to your front of house people um but it's it's very strange because you're working really really long shifts and meeting loads of creatives but not creating yourself um which can be uh quite frustrating um i think so you get to learn a lot about all of these shows but you're not there kind of really doing doing the job yourself whereas coming up with a show or two shows um you're so 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 in the creative mindset that like I haven't really been talking to any creatives that aren't on my two shows um, yet, so far anyway. Um, and I'm so, you know, I, I came out of our preview at four and just did an hour long note session and now I'm talking to you and then I'm going into another note session. And it's, it feels weirdly more, more inspiring, but also more like work. Yeah. Uh, whereas working box office is sort of more uh, kind of energy draining uh, but less brain draining, if that makes sense. Yeah, it it's, makes uh, sense. it's less active in the in the brain department, but very very tiring. <laughs> um, I have huge respect for box office people; they're wonderful people. Yeah, we love the box office people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you something? And I don't know if this is going to be rude, and I don't mean it to be rude. So please forgive me if yep. it comes off that way. You're doing the show for the entire month of the Fringe. Yes. Every day. How yes. do you not get fatigue with it? Ooh, um, that's probably a question you should ask the actors rather than me, because I, as the director, as I kind of explained earlier about previews and press night, my contract as director actually ends on press night oh. um, because the show is then the show is locked. Mm -hmm. um, so I can then stop thinking about it and go see other things and you know pop back to london and do other work and come back up and check on it um whereas the actors today was their first of 30 performances that yeah. they have to be on every day um so it's a it's a it's a different thing i think the the hope is that we've done enough uh work in the rehearsal room in terms of kind of intention and character work and real sort of thought work within the text that each time they perform it they know they know on impulse exactly what they need to do so it doesn't feel like acting it doesn't feel like a job it's just like oh obviously that's that's my thought so that's what I'm going to say next instead of being like oh this is this line that I really hate that I need to remember to say right because Lucy told me to um, yeah so the hope is that they won't get too fatigued by it um but it is i mean edinburgh is insanely draining as a you know it's it's the olympics of theater yeah. in a lot of ways yeah so what happens to the play after the fringe is it going elsewhere uh i hope so i don't know <laughs> um i think you know i think it depends how people receive it i would i would love it to to have a life beyond the fringe but at the moment i'm just trying to get to press night <laughs> just keep on holding on lucy you'll make it yeah <laughs> this is the voice of Lucy Jane Atkinson. She is the director of Anguish. It is playing at the Gilded Balloon Theatre from the 31st of July until the 26th of August at 3pm in the afternoon. So go along and have a little afternoon afternoon fun with the, with the show. Lucy, where can people get in touch with you and find out more about the show online? Uh, so if you want to get in touch with me, I'm on Twitter at Lucy Papuski. Um, and the show you can follow at Avalon Theatre uh, with the has hashtag Anguist, um, or just on the on the Edinburgh Fringe website. If you look up the title of the show, then all of the information's on there. And we should point out Anguist is spelled A N G I U S. A N G U I S. There you go. I was so close. I was so close. <laughs> I'm... I won't judge you. You're fine. Thank you so much. Lucy, it's been fantastic speaking to you today. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Anguis is performing at the dining room at the Gilded Balloon Teviot from August the 8th until the 11th with a wee day off until the 13th until the 26th. Next up, Harry and Chris joined me. I started by asking them what their show was all about and boy did I get an answer. Um, it is called Harry and Chris. This one's for the aliens. Um, our first show we called The Harry and Chris Show. The second show was called The Harry and Chris Show 2. Uh, and then last year we saved the world. Wow, that's not something you hear every day. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. As somebody who lives here, I appreciate that. Yeah, We were, we had you in mind when we did it. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. We, we figured having saved the world, we just had to take on the universe, get to it. Because if aliens are looking down on us now, who knows if they want to visit. You know, they might see Trump. They might see the situation in Iran. They might see the new Cats musical trailer. I don't know. That was so we wanted to provide an alternative. That trailer was something that exists, isn't it? Oh, it's so exciting. I mean, <laughs> so many people must have given it the green light for it to have got that far. Yeah. I've, I ju- yeah, I mean, I will go and see it. So it's done its job. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about this one's For the Aliens. What exactly is For the Aliens? Uh, so we are... Well, we, we started off by calling ourselves the UK's favourite comedy rap jazz duo. Mm-hmm. And then we've got a bit more confident, and we think we might be the world's favourite comedy rap jazz duo. So That's quite a challenge to lay down to yeah. other comedy oh, rap yeah. duos. If you're out there, then please get in touch. Our annual meetings are quite sparse. <laughs> um, but we thought, you know, if we wanted to try and represent this planet, what would we choose to celebrate? And so we pick some of our favourite things from the world, because we think it's very easy to be cynical and things can feel very divided but we want to try and bring people together and at points it's done in a serious way at points it's done in a completely ridiculous way but we just have a lot of fun because our natural disposition is to try and see the best in things yeah and we just have applied that to the whole world um but yeah we love it we love it it's our favorite show yet i think mm. that's kind of tricky to do at the moment though it might must be so easy to pile onto the negative how do you keep it positive um i mean Got a song about figs. <laughs> As in actual figs or? <laughs> figs and wasps. Figs and wasps. That's a good point, actually. I mean, I think every year it feels like it's the most negative yet. When we first started doing our show, it felt like things were really intense. And so we just did a whole song based on a news article that pandas were no longer classified as endangered. And that day, that was the only piece of good news in there because I think it's it's the tragedy and this kind of stress that gets people's attention. You know, if someone has a nice day, that's not breaking news. Yeah. Um, but mm. we've always liked to try and find that. And I think as time's gone on, we've tried to not ignore what's going on in the world, but try and see or try and bring some kind of joy to that and find light in the darkness because I think... There is always hope and there's always brilliant things that are worth celebrating. Uh, And, you know, whilst it feels like things are pretty hectic now compared to 200 years ago, we've we've made a lot of advancements. It's just that, yeah, in amongst everything, it's easy to focus on the negatives, I think. Yeah. At least pandas aren't extinct anymore, though. Yeah, well, absolutely. (laughs) We think that was because of us as well. We wrote a song. We're claiming them all. Performed it up in Edinburgh two years ago. And that year they announced that Chan Chan the Panda in Edinburgh Zoo was had become pregnant during the fringe so we, uh, thought it must be we us. think it's because of our song yeah and then we found out after the fringe that she wasn't actually pregnant she was just faking a pregnancy <sighs> so she could get more food from the zookeepers but if anything that's more impressive <laughs> <laughs> so we say we in the show we say we got a panda pregnant we saved the world because uh, we wrote a song about the um oncoming apocalypse and then it didn't happen yep. uh and then we wrote an england world cup song then we reached the semi-finals. So we thought we got superpowers. Uh, so we are the right candidates. Reached them twice, so men's team and women's team. That's so true. Far-reaching ramifications. Yeah. Although yeah. doing a song about England's World Cup team in Scotland for an entire month oh. and yeah. um, surviving is sort of as much of an achievement, we think. That's more of an achievement than a panda getting pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put that out there. <laughs> Although that's a brilliant idea that the panda wanted more food so it pretended to be pregnant. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know I if it do would that. work with humans, but if if there are any pandas out listening to this, who are, if there's any hungry pandas, that's my top tip for you. <laughs> I am big amongst the panda community. Great, this that's what massive. I figured. I thought, I thought this would be the station they would listen to. <laughs> How has the fringe changed since you were up last time, and what are you enjoying about it this time? 
I think it's changed for us because when we first came up here, we were in the spoken word section of the program. Uh, and so it meant people came with sort of varied expectations, but the overwhelming response was that it was surprisingly funny for a spoken word show. Uh, whereas the last few years, we've gone into the comedy section, and thankfully people haven't come out and said that was surprisingly word speaky. Um, but it means that we're now, you know, we know loads of other acts up here, and it's, it's amazing. I don't think any other industry you have a whole month where everyone's just in the same place. And so we get to catch up with loads of people that we really like and see lots of other shows. And so for us, we sort of feel like we are now comedy boys, yeah, no, <laughs> jazz sorry. rap comedy boys, as that's opposed to kind name. of floating between too many genres. And so we love coming up here. And I think, again, it's that thing of it's easy to focus on the negatives. Whilst you're up here, there's, there's so much that can go wrong. But I think to have an opportunity to do what you love in front of people every day for a month is something that I would not trade for anything. So we, we love being up here. We're very happy. And yeah. we try to not be obnoxiously happy because not everyone's having a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> Jazz rap comedy boys would be great on a t-shirt. Yeah, well, we yeah it came up in the show yesterday. and Rejected Maybe with a Z title. on the end. Oh, I can see that. Comedy boys. Yeah. Uh. Maybe B O I Z. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, That's kicking yeah. off. The kids would like that. Oh. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> that's who we're after. <laughs> we do get um, a whole range of ages. That's one thing we love. We do get kids in the audience. Yeah. And once we had Generation Bingo, we had a, a mum who had brought both her son and her mum. So it was like grandma, mum, and son. And so we we need to get some kind of loyalty card when that happens. Yeah. But like, if you come to seven shows, you get the eighth show for free. Yeah. Exactly. That's nice. Maybe eight and you get the ninth. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> Where can people find out more about you guys and about the show? Mm. So we are, we're on the internet. If are we? Yeah. Oh, come uh, on. We, it used to be when you searched Harry and Chris, uh, it came up with stuff about Blondie because their members were Debbie, Harry and, and Chris, Chris Stein. Stein. So they've got our entire name <laughs> sort of sandwiched between their names. Um, but we now are up there. Uh, and <laughs> on Twitter, it's Harry and Chris, a bit like fish and chips, because Harry and Chris there was already taken by a joint fan account of Harry Styles from One Direction and Chris Martin from Coldplay at, at the, the same, same time. time. So, yeah. I mean, we recommend following them too, but if you want to find out stuff. about us, Harry and Chris, otherwise on our website, we've got tour dates, tour dates, details about everything, if you just search Harry and Chris. See, I wouldn't have thought there was much crossover between the One Direction fan base and the Coldplay. It's like the circles. Oh, uh, there in the middle. was... At the Brit Awards 2017, the two met, and that is now this person's profile picture. I mean, I wouldn't know so much about it if we weren't also following them. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they don't put in the surnames, and there's things, things like, you know, uh, I really, really love Harry, and I'm very grateful for Chris, and so we'll just retweet that and pretend it's about yeah. us. But one day, obviously, when we form a super group with, with Harry Styles and Chris Martin, mm -hmm. uh, we can form Harry and Chris and Harry and Chris. But until that moment, I think... We'll just settle for Harry and Chris. I'm trying to think how that name would be. Would it be Harry and Harry and Chris and Harry and Chris or Harry, Harry, Chris, Chris? Chris, Harry, Harry, Chris? Harry, Chris, Chris. That's like Chitty, Chitty, Bang, Bang. Harry, Harry, Chris. Chrissy, Chrissy has, has. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be next year's Fringe show. <laughs> really made myself laugh. <laughs> that, um, yeah, I think you just got to change the ants. It'll be yeah. Harry plus Chris, ampersand, ampersand Harry. Harry. And and Word and Chris. Yeah, yeah. That works. Nice and easy to remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, if you have people coming along, you can get them being like, so you're here to see Harry and Chris or Harry and Chris? Well, I'm here for Harry, but I'm here for Chris. Which Chris? I mean, this Chris? No, that Chris. <laughs> yeah, we'll just, we'll take any. Yeah, we'll you're we'll here to see Harry Styles? Great, that's in yeah, there. Again. That's Good enough. Again, Good again enough. the show. <laughs> Harry and Chris, the original Harry and Chris, mm. it's been great to have you today. Thank you so much for Thanks. your time. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. Yeah. Harry and Chris, this one's for the aliens, is being performed at White Belly at the Underbelly Cowgate from the 8th until the 24th of August. My next guest is Travis J, and I started by asking him how he was enjoying his fringe experience. I'm really having a good time. It's uh, day five. 
But I was here a few days before my show started, right. taking it all in, climbing mountains, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot uh, of them around here, so... That's it, that's it. If you're going to the store, you climb a mountain. Yeah, you somebody, know. <laughs> somebody bolted Edinburgh to the side of a hill. Bro, Thank you to that person I'm who did that. I'm telling you, it's ridiculous, man. You take a left and that's it. You're on a trek. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I'm enjoying it, man. The energy's nice. It's so vibrant in the city right now. You, you walk right for, for some drinks and you get shoved 25 flies in your hand. It's good times. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your show and what it what it's called, how you came up with it, and a li- a- 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 sure. So my show is titled "Funny Petty Cool," and this is like a crash course introduction into me, Travis J, the comedian, right? So like, you know, the funny side, I I hope it's funny. You know, that's <laughs> that's the main ingredient. Petty. So this is just something I want to reveal, like my petty side. I think we all have a petty side deep down. There's just little things that we just can't let go in life. Oh yeah, I've got a few. So I feel like, you know, let's put them out there and embrace them as a good quality. Cool, I, I consider myself cool. But normally, people who consider themselves cool aren't cool. Mm-hmm. So there's times where I feel like I'm being cool and I freaking ain't. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's a great show. And I talk about my, my growing up, you know, becoming a father. You know, I, I, I open up on certain things that are quite touching as well, like my passing of my grandfather and how that forced me to face some truths within myself as a man. So, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful journey. That's how I would describe my show. It sounds like it touches on some kind of heavy things, especially, as you said, with, with the passing of your grandfather. Yeah. Has this show helped you deal with things in your life? Do you know what? Now you mention it, I probably will have to say, yeah. Because I think with, with me, I'm a very personal comedian. So most of my material comes from lived experiences. Um, you know, you'll hear me speak about my kids quite a bit, and all of those stories are true. And, you know, with my grandfather's, like, that, that section of my show... I, I can laugh at these things now, uh, but at the time it was a very tragic time. But, you know, n- my skill as a comic is to be able to turn real life situations into material. So there's always a part of me whenever I go through like a tough point in my life where I'm like, I know, I know we're feeling rough now, but this is going to be one hell of a bit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's quite weird, but yeah. <laughs> you know, what? that's kind of my family's tagline. Whenever anything bad happens, which seems to happen more often than not, yep. it's like someday this will be a fantastic story. This is it. This is it. And that's kind of the ethos of my show. Like a lot of it is just, it was real. It wasn't fun at the time, but hey, let's laugh at it, man. Someday it'll be funny. There you go. There you go. And how does the audience react to a show? Do they go along with you or does it get, do they get emotional at times? Um, you know what? Sometimes, like when I was drafting this material, like in the previews, it was very heavy when I spoke about it initially. And I was just like, whoa, this is too deep. Like, because after we get to this point, everybody's sad now. And I don't really want to take people to that place. So it's, it's changed now. It's not so emotional. But uh, I think it's one of those things where if you've lived it, you'll connect in some way. And like my, my thing is I like to connect to the audience with my stand-up, with my material. I leave a bit, a lot of me is in my stuff. So I think if I can connect with you on a human level, we can laugh together. So that's kind of my approach to stand-up. And has that been difficult getting the words you want to get it perfect or at least as close to it as Um, you think it could be sometimes sometimes it's sometimes it's difficult sometimes it's quite smooth sailing but you know sometimes you get to a point where it's like the comedian in me is like yo say this because that's gonna be funny and we move away from the truth and it's just now it's now changed the whole thing entirely but we've gone for funny instead and sometimes we get too deep and it's just like yo that's that's not enjoyable. Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. all about finding that right balance. You know what? That happens to me so many times. If I'm on the air, something will come into your head and you'll think, say that, it'll be funny. And then you'll say it. And you, you <laughs> the moment you cut, you go to a song, it's like, what? Should have left it alone. <laughs> yeah. I should have thought an extra split second about that. I was doing just fine. And now I ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Does that happen to you at all on stage? Do you get moments uh, like that? It happens to everybody. Like, you get that moment of spontaneity and you're just like, oh, my days, let's ad lib. And then you do it and it's just like, it was fine before. Why did you add all that unnecessary crap? Yeah. So, uh, just one of those things. You bounce back, keep it moving, man. Travis, where can people find out more about you and the show online? So, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. My follow- my handle is Travis J E N T. That's spelled Travis T R A V I S J A Y E N T. Uh, my website, www.travisj.co.uk. My show is taking place at Just a Tonic, the Mash House in the Attic Room at 2.35 p.m. every day of the run, except for the 12th of August and the 16th of August. What do you do on your on the days off? <sighs> well, I haven't had a day off yet, so I actually don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> but in between time, I'm playing my PS4. That's a good thing to do. Watching comedians 
in cars getting coffee for Seinfeld. <laughs> mm. I have feel the the idea is good, but I just can't get behind Jerry as as an interviewer. I don't know why. Do you know what? I feel like he's not really interviewing. He's chatting to his friends. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So sometimes the conversation is so personal. It's just like, this is just for you two. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You shouldn't like, be seeing this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> turn the camera off. Edit this part. Yeah. But, you know, I think I just, I just appreciate that these guys have achieved so much. Mm. And it's just like, because I have these, I have my friends on, on the circuit. And when we sit and we chat, it's just guys banter. Yeah. So I watch their version. I think, freaking hell, the banter is still the same, even at the top. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's just one of those things, I guess. Travis, thank you for your time today, mate. Hey, no Thanks. Problem. Thanks for having me, dude. <laughs> Travis J is doing a show which is called Funny, Petty, Cool, which was the original title for the Peter Greenwood show, and he is performing it at Just for Tonic at the Mash House from August the 8th until the 11th, with a day off, and then back from the 13th to the 15th with a final wee day off, then from the 17th until the 25th. My final guest today is Susan Riddle, and we got into the age-old question, what exactly do you do when you're all hot and sweaty and just icky and someone asks for a hug? How are you, Susan? Are you well? I'm good, I. I'm a little bit sweaty and hot, as everyone is at the fringe, but I am bearing up. (laughs) You know what? I'm exactly the same. I'm all hot and sweaty, and I've been asking people, like, can we take a picture of the social media? And they've been putting their arms around me, and they've been so cut. Like, I've been looking to see if they've done the <laughs> face. Do you know what it is? Everybody's in the same boat. Everybody's yeah. worried about the same thing, so <laughs> it's fine. We'll get there. <laughs> so, tell me about your show. What's, um, what's it like? What is well, it? This is like my debut hour. I'm doing my first hour, so I've done the fringe before, twice before. Last year I did half an hour with my friend, and the year before that I did like a compilation show. So this is me eh, moving on to doing my hour, and it's called Dovey Day, and it's just basically about how I'm really lazy and I I can't be bothered doing anything. I'm, I'm wondering, you're not allowed to swear, are you? You can swear if you <laughs> like. <laughs> I'll believe it. I was going to say I'm, I can't be asked doing anything really. I just like to lie down. Um, and it's just me kind of finding it from the audience if, if anybody feels the same and they've I been responding the really well <laughs> <laughs> there's just something for want of a better term there is no term to describe exactly how nice it is it's just nice to lie down it is and do it's nothing so much better than sitting yes <laughs> like no matter how comfy the chair is no matter how far it reclines it's I nice to just lie down I know I feel as if like there's a kind of billion pound industry based on people just lying down like reiki and all that stuff like mm-hmm. i mean really what are you doing you're just you're just wanting to lie down but you yeah. want to justify it yeah so you pay somebody 30 quid to like hover over you <laughs> just to <laughs> just to justify it yeah Aye, so everybody just needs to chill <laughs> and how have you been enjoying the fringe this year because you've been up here before for different as you said you've been up here a couple of times before how are you enjoying it this year i i am enjoying it um i I'm just kind of, I was filming a sketch show for BBC Scotland right. directly before this and then I just get kind of flung into the fringe so I'm still trying to find my <laughs> bearings and I'm just like, what's happening, where am I? But I, I'm enjoying it, it's yeah. good. Day, th- day four, they don't know, day three. Oh, day four. You, you lose track I of think. time and space. Yeah, <laughs> although some people started on their 31st. Aye, that's of July, right, so this is technically day five for some people. Jeez, oh, they're, they're keen. <laughs> <laughs> a bit enthusiastic. They need to come and see your show and chill out. <laughs> just everybody just come in and we'll, we'll have a nap. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I could, I could see if there was a show where it was like, welcome along, just get just your sleeping there. bag. <laughs> that's a great idea. I've missed range. a trick, haven't yes. I? I shouldn't have bothered writing all these jokes. Just everybody come in and lie down and we'll not tell anyone. Yeah. If you just go away and give me like a five star review... <laughs> <laughs> it'll be like a wee secret <laughs> yeah it's like fight club nap club you don't talk about it <laughs> that's brilliant that honestly. really is yeah. and it's it can it can cater for everybody if you do it at lunchtime we can get people coming after work they can aye. go and nap for an hour aye aye <sighs> but you can go and see it. I'm, I was getting some culture and mm-hmm. seeing a show but no we're all just getting a bit of shut eye <laughs> yeah you just say, yeah, I, I was at the fringe during my lunch hour. Oh, <laughs> yes, don't ask yes. what I was doing. Highly productive. Um, <laughs> wait to see this show, a bit, a bit alternative. <laughs> <laughs> so what has it been like going from half an hour to an hour? Has it been difficult? Um, well, I, it is because, ugh, just like, 
I often wonder, like, why would anybody would want to listen to anybody for an hour? <laughs> so that's going through my head as I'm on stage. I'm like, nobody is interested enough <laughs> to hold somebody's attention for an hour, especially in, like, these times where we've got, like, all the internet. And, like, I used to get bored watching, do you remember Vine? Yes. And it was six second videos. Yeah. They could barely hold my attention sometimes. <laughs> so I'm like, this is just like goes against everything. Do you know what I mean? But I, it's good. I like it. Um, you can kind of delve into things more and you've got a bit of time just to kind of relax and, and just kind of get across what you're going to say in that eye. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Where can people find out about you and the show online? Where, where can people find that? But sorry, what was that? Where can people find out about you and the show online? All right, okay, so I'm on Twitter. So my... <laughs> I'm trying to remember. It's at, Su- uh, at Susan slash Riddle slash. Uh, and if you go on my Twitter page, it's got all the details for my tickets and like where you can get those. Or else you can just type my name into, into Google and it'll all come up. It'll can, come up. If you want to buy a ticket. It's a, you can buy a ticket or it's pay what you want. So you right. can either just like buy a ticket so that you've definitely got a seat or come down and just chance it if you're passing by and then just chuck some money in the bucket or not at the end. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, I'll, don't worry, I'll take out the or not so people, <laughs> so people will put money in the bucket. I, know, I need to stop being so humble. <laughs> just really, just give me your money. <laughs> yeah. It's like Geld off at Live Aid. Just give me your money. <laughs> give me your <laughs> Bleep. <laughs> That's what I shout at the audience at the end of my show. Really? No. <laughs> but I'm going to start doing it now. Please do. I, I would love... If, I'm co- if I come along and I don't hear, give me a fucking money, I'm going to be so disappointed. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Susan, it's been fantastic having you. Thank you it's for your time lovely. today. Thanks very much for having me. Susan Riddle's show is called Duvet Day. She is performing at Monkey Barrel 5 every gosh darn day from the 8th of August until the 11th, with a day off until the 13th until the 25th. And that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and every single body in between is it for today's episode. This has been episode 3 of the Peter Greenwood Show at the Edinburgh Fringe. On tomorrow's show, episode 4, I've got... Uh, My name's Simon Brodkin. And I'm also going to be joined by... Uh, My name is Sarah Swire... Hello, I'm Alan McHugh, as well as many others. Thank you for your time and your patience and for listening. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, every single body. Bye. <laughs>